I will formally welcome everybody. I think it's time to get going here. So uh, welcome to the uh, final event, uh, online event of, of the 2021 season. Um, this has been an, an amazing adventure, uh, not without challenge and difficulty uh, at times, but um, I'm really so grateful to the board of the BCS and please go on our website and take a look at all the wonderful people who are involved um giving their time and their energy without further ado i want to present david starkweather wonderful cellist colleague scholar take it away <laughs> okay thanks kate well my own start with the box suites was with my very first teacher richard anastasio out in the bay area near san francisco he was a devotee of bach and so I learned a lot about phrasing and the musical lines and things like that. He produced an edition of the box suites where he took out all the bar lines. Beyond that, then my next exposure to these manuscripts was I met Vladimir Orlov up in Banff. He sent me a photocopy of the Kellner copy of the suites. And this got me working on it a little bit, comparing with the Anna Magdalena Bach manuscript. I didn't think that much about it really at that point. That was in the early 80s. But in the 90s, I got a grant at the university to get actual uh, photo plates of the Anna Magdalena Bach and the Kilner manuscripts. And I produced my first edition during that time, scanning them in black and white. And so all that's been redone over the next couple decades since then using the color scans that are now available and much higher resolution. And I've discovered all sorts of things. So this was really my own, for my own edification, really. I just wanted to learn more about the suites and make decisions in a nice way of comparing these different sources. But it's become something much more than that. To get started, I think I would like to go right into the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to share this with everybody and we'll just page through it. We have a break in the middle of it, and then we'll get back to some more PowerPoint at that point. This is what a typical page of the manuscripts looks like. And you can see a lot of bleed through from the back side of the page because uh, the ink came through from whatever was written on the back. This is the Saraband midway down the page, you can see, but it's very hard to read what's going on there. And to compare with the other manuscripts uh, is quite difficult. Let's just run through the different sources we've got. First of all, there is the Anna Magdalena Bach source, and this is the first line you find in that manuscript. You can see the dates there, and we'll be getting back to the dates. I've made a timeline which should help explain that sort of thing. And this is B, the Kilner source, and uh, you can see the handwriting is a little different. The dates are actually slightly before the Anna Magdalena Bach manuscript. And then we have the third source, C, is known as Westfall, discovered in 1830, but had been written sometime in the second half of the 18th century. And finally, D is the Treg manuscript, an anonymous copyist, and it was offered for sale in 1799. So we don't really know where it came from or who wrote it. And finally, uh, the first edition came out in 1824, and it actually clarified some things perhaps, but it made a lot of mistakes and uh, editorial changes too. So this is a very suspicious edition to rely upon. And then in the fifth suite, we have source H, which is the J.S. Bach autograph manuscript of suite number three for lute, which is the same as suite number five for cello. The cello suite came first and was written in scordatura with the A string tuned down to G, but Bach wrote this out in what's known as his drafting hand, uh, not his fair copy handwriting. Sweet five quad is a good place to start, I think. And just to remind you. The top line here shows us what the lute suite looked like. You can see these are all the various sources and this is how they show up in the edition. With my modern notation at the very bottom with fingerings and 
Boeing's provided, and also many other little um, details about what is found in the manuscripts. So I use various signs to compare these manuscripts. The first one I'd like to tell you about is the X, which shows a note that is disagreeing with other sources. And if it appears in brackets, then it's some sort of comparison mark, which is a very likely error. And this one, just to remind you all how this sounds. Oh, I'm on the wrong cello on this one. We've got the Sportatura cello. <laughs> and so just a moment, sorry. That's funny. Sorry, I have to I have to chime in on that because David, when he we went through this little rehearsal the other day for this presentation, he had both cellos out and this time like a chef, like a chef he was juggling his uh, <laughs> his tools. Well now I have to juggle back. Yeah, here we go. So we have <laughs> You see where the X is written, you would have which with that G sounds probably wrong and none of the other sources uh, seem to reflect that. But that's a good example of the use of this sign. I also use this sign for trills and other ornaments, a little hashtag sign. You see the use of the X when there's a note that doesn't appear in some other sources. So the ornament, if you look in my uh, modern notation at the bottom, uh, is then indicated with parentheses around the trill and showing that that trill only appears in sources C and D. And then this next trill, which also would not be something we're used to hearing. So <laughs> something like that, uh, is in sources B, C, and D. So this is new information for a lot of people, I think. Uh, I had never known about trills on those notes before. And then we have a rhythmic duration symbol. And this is an example that is from the third suite jig. That's what we're used to hearing, but... Some people play that version because that's what's in source A. You can see how I've put brackets around those and that indicates it's a very likely error. Then this not equal sign is used on slurs. I don't put it on every single slur. Uh, that would be a little repetitive. But you can see that this little slur at the top in the A source is shorter. So you have the... I think we're all used to hearing the whole uh, five note slur. And so um, if you looked at the whole score, you could, you could see C, D, and E also have that long slur. We have um, also this comparison symbol, which is used on notes such as the one with the arrow there where you don't really see any other similar markings in the other sources. So we have... So there's a slur, and the slur doesn't appear in the other manuscripts. You can see that here, looking down at B, C, D, and E. No sign of that slur. However, it's interesting to note that if you then go to the next line, with the uh, sequence of that phrase with a then we have the slurry in both A and B. So it validates it a little bit that it's used later in the sequence. I think Bach generally used the same bowings throughout a sequence. Uh, there are very few instances where he changes bowings uh, during a sequence. In my edition, I did a lot of cleanup on these scores. And this is a typical enlargement of what I had to deal with, or maybe this was one of the worst ones. And when cleaned up, it looks like that. So getting rid of all of that background and suddenly you can see what was written. 
Here's another example from the Corona Suite 5, getting rid of all of those uh, nearby lines and suddenly you can see what's going on there. And one more example, the CeraVanda Suite 6, just getting rid of peripheral sort of debris. <laughs> At this point, we should go to the edition for a moment and we can talk about how it's set up. This is what the contents of the edition looks like at the front page. The underlined things you see here are all hyperlinks. And uh, the hyperlinks are clickable links that take you places. So each of these suite hyperlinks will take you to that suite. For instance, if we say, okay, let's look at suite number two, then we get this directory for suite two. The upper section here shows manuscripts and this shows a score. So let's say you're looking at Alamond of the second suite and this is what you would expect to see. But if you wanted to go and look at the score for that, for the first line, you could click on the page number or on the title of the movement and it pops you into the version showing the manuscripts. At the bottom here is the line you were just looking at and you can then jump right back the same way the page number or the title of the movement takes you there. So let's say you were looking at the Alamon and then the third line, you wanted to look at the section with the trills. Just go to that and then page two pages forward and you're on that line. So it makes it quite accessible to jump around and compare things. In addition, going back to the contents here, uh, there's a section I wrote titled Interpretation of Sources. And this is a rather uh, scholarly look at the sources and their background. And we'll go through some of that today in the rest of the PowerPoint presentation. In uh, the editorial notes, it explains what we've already gone through with the comparison symbols, the sources, and then talking more about slurs and ornaments, dynamics, pitches, and also how to navigate if you're on a computer, these sorts of navigation things are helpful, but uh, if you're on your iPad, you can simply touch it and it jumps to those locations. So the uh, hyperlinks were just a really great innovation that I figured out how to add. The whole thing is something like 319 pages. So getting back to the PowerPoint presentation, if we then take another look at that page of Suite five that I was playing earlier. Getting the score to Turricello again. The interesting thing with the markings that you'll notice are that there are some X's in brackets that run down the last measure. And we can zoom in on that a little bit and see what's happening in, first of all, just the loot suite version. I want to point out here in the lute suite that Bach was writing it in G minor. And so the top clef, which he used tenor clef for that, therefore reads as bass clef in C minor with the small change that instead of B naturals, you would have F sharps. That makes the top line very legible and easy to compare with the cello suite. The bass clef, however, is obviously written in G, and so you can see the bass line going uh, from G upward. And in addition, Bach added a few bass notes that are marked with X's and a few appoggiaturas marked with X's. There are also a couple of um, dots on notes in the third measure that Bach put there in the lute suite. So it seems appropriate if you were playing it on cello, you would probably play those notes with dots also. The interesting thing here though, is that Anna Magdalena Bach, the source A made a mistake uh, putting two ledger lines on the uh, third measure. So we have... <laughs> then at C, D, and E, we see the same mistake cropping up there. This shows us that these three copyists had some 
connection to source A. So they picked up this mistake that had been made in Anamagdalena box manuscript and copied it that way. It's really quite clear when you look at the musical line of the bass line that the E flat is the necessary note. And this is showing in modern notation. You can see the E flat is noted to be in sources B and H, and then a C is in sources A, C, D, and E. And if you then watch for the bass line, you have the C at the bottom. Steady, uh, very typical upward moving line that Bach was very fond of. That's if you wanted to look at it in normal tuning. I just popped it into from one version to the other version because both, both versions are available in my edition. I first learned it with normal tuning, but there are things that are not playable if you are playing them with normal tuning. For instance, that chord at measure four has a line through the F. There's just not any good way to play that F with an A flat. Whereas in Scordatura, you have. So there are some different spellings of chords that Bach was able to use because of the tuning. And there's also a certain richness to it. Because in the C, you get this G harmonic and the G. All these G, lots of Gs ringing on the dominant. Now this is a timeline of when these various sources came about. And I think it's important to uh, first explain about the lettering system. You can see there's A, B, C, D, E, and H. And those are all authenticated manuscripts we have, which uh, exist. Everything that's written as a Greek letter, uh, this is a protocol for this sort of timeline where you're imagining that there must have been something. Those don't really exist anymore, or um, we just are guessing that they did exist. And so the Greek letters are used for that. So we know for sure that in 1720, Bach wrote the violin sonatas and partitas. And it's conjectured that it was at the same time that he wrote the suites for cello. It was his usual procedure then to write out a clean copy at some point where he often made some revisions, uh, made things more clear, maybe added something. You can see the arrow between those first two. And then he was in Fitton at that point. This was a much more like chamber music and chamber orchestra oriented situation than where he'd been either before or after. And these two court cellists and gamba players are both possible copyists who might have made another copy, which I've just named Gamma. So that would have happened before Bach moved to Leipzig. So after he moved, then we have a dated copy by Kilner of the violin sonatas and partitas. And that's dated 1726, which is actually a year before Kilner met Bach. That copy was obviously made from some intermediate copy. It was not made directly from Bach's original because there are again some clues in the mistakes that were copied. And so what we then find is that he made a copy of the cello suites and these dates are really quite secure. So the Anna Magdalena Bach copy may have been made from the original composition before he made the clean copy. And meanwhile, Bach was making a transcription of Suite 5, and it was during those same years. They can date these things because of the kind of paper that was used and the handwriting. So these two things were going on at once. And it is a possibility that Bach was busy making his new version from the copy that was clean, and his wife was copying the original. So then all of these things led over the next span of years, which is quite a spread of years from 1731 all the way up to maybe 1780 or 1750. Um, there were probably a number of intermediate copies made by other people, but just guessing about two of them, 
one of them was listed in an index of music by CPE Bach. And so that's one possible source. And another one there you see at the bottom, the Epsilon was an intermediate copy that drew upon the lineage through the Kilner copy and the Lute Suite. All of these things became much more confused by different sources being used. And we have in C, D, and E, we have things that show up from both the A copy and the B copy. I'm very indebted especially to Russell Stinson's book on the Kilner manuscripts, in which he was able to date things very carefully. You recall these two things going on here. So the violin sonatas and partitas by Kilner had a date written in them, and the Kilner copy of the cello suites did not. He was trying to make a version of suite five without scordatura. So he was transcribing from scordatura back to regular tuning. Being an organist, he had no use for cello tuning that had a string tuned down. But this was difficult for him. It, and I think it confused him many times as you look at his copy. In the jig, he actually only got a couple measures into it and then didn't copy the rest of it. And he didn't copy the saraband at all either in the fifth suite. The other person I'm very indebted to is James Greer, who wrote a book called The Critical Editing of Music. He talks about reasonable competing readings versus clear errors. And this is an example of a reasonable choice between both of these. If you imagine the A flat. <laughs> with the A flat going up. Whereas the Anna Magdalena Bach has and they're both legitimate. That's Greer's point on that one. And what is important is the clear errors. You see, if one copy had made an error, then it becomes very clear that if a copy has that error in it, it was coming from that origin. It's very unlikely that two people would make the exact same error. So that's one of Greer's elements of his book. And he talks a lot about filiation, which is perhaps a word we haven't come across before, but it's, it's the ancestry of these sources. He actually uses many examples from the box suites in his book. And if you wanted to get into more detail from that point of view, I would recommend his book. So looking back at the timeline, you can see how we have some contamination is what he calls it. If you look at source C, it's coming with sources leading to it from two directions. And the same thing with source D and then with source E. All of those things are a little bit more suspect. The earlier, more contemporaneous copies probably have much more validity and didn't have any external editing going on. Okay, well, coming back to this Suite 5 Quran, just to remind you what we were looking at with that low C instead of E flat, uh, it got copied from source A to source C, D, and E. And so that shows this filiation going on. And there are many other examples that show a similar connection in the Quran of the sixth suite, we have this passage. So you just wouldn't want to hear with a in a source like this, there's an obvious wrong note. And then it's quite obvious where it came from just because of the chronology. The Anna Bach was written probably 50 years earlier. Okay, so I have a few other examples to look at with this sort of connection. This is from the Suite 5 Gavotte. We're looking at, after the double bar there, so we have... <laughs> If you look at where the X's are with brackets around them, 
those are another place with an extra ledger line. Nobody would want to do that particular note, especially in scordatura, because it's not an F, it's an E flat. Uh, anything written in sources A, C, D, or E uh, needs to be read one step lower if it's on the upper string. That just would be a terrible thing to even play. So I won't play that for you with an E flat. <laughs> uh, but you can see what is going on with those two notes. They are correct in the lute suite, so in box handwriting there, and then in source B. Kilner obviously had a greater connection to what Bach then used in the lute suite. And here's sources C, D, and E, again showing that incorrect note. And if you wanted to look at it in either scordatura or normal notation, this is comparing the two. In the Aleman up there at the top, uh, that uh, maybe an ink spot or maybe a dash of wine that fell on it. This was in box manuscript uh, for the lute suite. And so you can see what it looks like on the whole page in that spot with the wine. <laughs> Just kind of a fun little detail. This rhythm is marked there with the blue lines. You can see that the rhythm matches up between the lute suite and B, very similar to the previous example we were looking at. Whereas in A, it's an eighth note and two sixteenths, and that's reversed in both B and H. And if you look in C, D, and E, it's also the way it was in A. So this is with the eighth and two sixteenths, and that matches with these. So again, they were influenced by the source A. And here you see all of them lined up. An interesting comparison though, is that, so we have a You see that Bach made other changes in the lute suite. He sometimes double dotted, and so it was a matter of the instrument as well as anything. So if you look at the lute suite, so he's double dotting in some spots. Going back to the previous page, you also see an appoggiatura at this point that is added. I'm not sure where C, D, and E got that appoggiatura. It's not in either A or B, but somebody along the way put it in. And from what I know of the 18th century, appoggiaturas and ornaments became much more prominent as the century went on. And so I think that there are um, many appoggiaturas and things that you find in sources C, D, and E that uh, were added by a later editor. Measure 23, we have this. <laughs> So I'm not so sure about that one. I, I don't think I would choose to play that one myself. Um, but you can see it has some validity because it's in Bach's lute suite. Kate was very interested in the idea that Bach made a mistake. And so I, I put together this little example here. This is in source H at the top of the page. You can see the last measure has four notes written still in scordatura. He, he didn't manage to translate out, out of scordatura as he was making his lute suite at that point. Looking in a little more detail, we can zoom in on it. And I also put B right under it so that you could compare with that. As I said, Kellner was very confused by the scordatura also. And so you see that last measure, he was not knowing what to do. Uh, it, it needs, to be, um, as you can see in the scordatura at the bottom, um, raised up, a, a lowered a step from that. And this is what it would be in normal tuning. So both H and B should have been written to match up with normal tuning. Although in the lute suite, it would be not B natural, but F sharp. <laughs> You 
can see those last four notes of the measure are all written up a step. <laughs> so that's the end of my PowerPoint presentation. We can certainly go back to the edition. And what I would like to do actually is share with you some of the more annoying mistakes maybe that I've found. There, there's so many details we could talk about, but perhaps there's somebody who has a particular question about one spot that they know about, and we'd love to see what it looks like in my edition. I'll start off by just saying um, that that uh, place in the prelude of the G major that we're so accustomed to hearing that people play the B flat. Yeah. If you could demonstrate that, when we think about how many times we've heard the suite played? It's it's probably the most iconic cello movement, cello piece. Everybody knows this piece, even if they have never studied or or, or know anything about the cello. So if you could play this one passage, I think I think it's just enlightening. Yeah. So from the beginning of the line, there it's. So it's this, and if you were to zoom in on that, you can see my notes uh, show that the, the second note, the B natural, is in A, B, C, and D, whereas E put a flat on it. So it's the first edition, 1824, more than a century after the pieces were written that an editor decided that should be a flat and they liked the augmented second. The thing in the notation of the Baroque period is that whenever um, a note is written with an accidental, it has to be reiterated all the way through the measure. And so you see the first B in all of these sources doesn't have a flat on it. And then the fourth note of that beat has the flat. Yeah, I think it's amazing and to, to think how much sleuthing and research and digging around many people have done over the over the centuries to <laughs> to to learn what was correct, what was questioned, what was questionable, um, right. what's tasteful, what's what's in the context of the time of the person making the copy. It's yeah. really fascinating when you think about it. And I I um I, when I first saw your edition, David, I thought, wow, <laughs> I have a whole nother lifetime of studying here to, to unlearn the things that I've learned um, oh, yeah. and, and, and reevaluate. There, there's a good example in the jig of the second suite. Oh, here it is on the fourth line. So um, this place that goes. <laughs> the last two notes of that measure going up to the F are found in everything except source A. And so what we see in source A is a repetition of the previous three bars in terms of the 16th notes on top. And when a thing like that happens where something is repeated in the wrong spot from a previous measure or a following measure, it's called a mistake of perseveration. This is another thing I learned in the Greer book. Um, this is one of the types of mistakes or errors that you find in copyist mistakes. So an error of perseveration. Other kinds of errors include, well, simply the editor of the first edition, for instance, changing something like that B natural to a B flat, or just omitting something in one of the copies is sometimes a more devastating error because then we don't know whether it really was omitted or added by somebody else leaves a question mark if both versions are acceptable, such as that A flat in, in, uh, in, uh, in that suite, that A flat, it could go either way. So um, yeah, this jig is an interesting example of that. There is no, there is no um, collection of Bach suites in Bach's actual hand. <laughs> which is why there's so much debate and why this work um, 
is so so valuable. I mean, anyone who's a cellist who has studied these pieces, you you can buy. Uh, I think it's the um, the Baron Rider edition, which is quote unquote the performance edition. Then they published around in the aughts, mid aughts, two thousands, a publication of each of these editions. Um, and to, to do this kind of work, you had to lay everything out on a huge table and, you know, use post-it notes to find the particular spot in each edition to, to, to do the research. And that, that, that's what David's done here. And through the miracle of technology, you, you can put it, your cursor on the spot and show it in all five editions at the same moment. It's an enormous time saver and um just an incredibly useful tool <laughs> i find and you can take it with you you know you don't have to carry around a, a box of music this thick <laughs> so um on my um second page of the edition you can see where these sources are located uh the top three are in the uh Stutzbibliothek in berlin and then the fourth one in vienna and then there's one that's in Brussels, uh, the, the loot suite. And did any of this come from Gesellschaft? No. No, that's... And yeah. all of these are available online. Anybody can go and find these from these libraries. If you want to download your own copy of Source C, download it and uh, have fun with it. <laughs> so that's what I've been doing for decades, never ending puzzle really, so a lot of fun. Any other spots someone would like us to look at? Here's a note from uh, Jeffrey Wang. I have a question in the D major suite. Okay. In the prelude, the last note of measure 91. I've decided it should be a G on the last note. Um, I'm going to enlarge the bottom of the page so everyone can see that. We're coming along on A. <laughs> so not too many people play that G, but it creates the dominant seventh for then going down to D. And if you look at the sources, you find the G in source E. And then all the way through here, this is all in viola clef. So it's a little confusing to read, but you can figure out that this is a G. This one in source B is a little bit, now this is source B, a, a little bit hard to read. Uh, maybe they had written the A and then made it into a G or vice versa. But you can see G's all the way through here. <laughs> right after this, there's another good example. It's this place that goes uh, And then this next one. And that last note of the measure, or the second to last note with the thumb on it right here, a lot of people go back to C sharp because you find that C sharp in a number of the editions. You see E, D, C, now B has the A. And if we think about this filiation we were just talking about, so source A making a, a C sharp right there um, would lead then to these sources C, D, and E copying that. Source B may be correct. And so that's why the X doesn't have a bracket around it. And th that's why I would favor doing that, uh, playing an A at that point. In terms of musicality too, the previous goes at the end of the previous bar. See this? And then in this one, so it's the same pattern. And in terms of the way Bach worked, I think that is much more likely. 
and it's leading down down to the F sharp. So that's a fascinating example. Very interesting. Um, some people wanted the link or a place to. Oh yeah. Get your but uh, someone shared it. Starkweatherdavid.com. That's right. Yeah. Forward slash box suites edition. So you can find it there. I think we've also linked to it on the VCS website. Good. Yeah. Are there other questions and things? How about from Bongshan? How about F sharp in the D minor prelude, measure 50? Have you heard it played F natural? I have tried it myself. <laughs> D minor prelude. Don't you mean the one at measure 35? This one that is off. Right here. And source B has an F sharp there. Is that the one you meant, Bong Shin? Yes, that too, actually. But uh, measure 50, I, I've heard more often people play, some people play F natural. In measure 50. Yeah. Right. Have you heard it? Well, you can see the F sharp is written. I don't think there's any discussion about that. It's an F sharp in all the sources. I, I think I've heard it um, F natural a couple of times in my life, but maybe uh, that was a mistake. Uh, but yes, earlier measure that you demonstrated, yeah, that was my question too. Maybe we can zoom in on it like this, and then it's obviously an F sharp. And that's in source A, B, C, D, and E, all of them. Here's another question. Yeah. Can you clarify in the notation of the time accidentals did not carry through the bar? When did that convention change? I know it was starting to change by the time of the first edition. And there, I'm just saying that because of what I've observed in these sources. The first edition sort of does it here and there and not in other places. Does uh, problems of consistency arise from this? I don't think so. There are some places where even in the, the very old manuscripts, a, an accidental wouldn't be copied into the very beginning of the next bar if it was right at the end of the previous bar. Things like that. Uh, they just sort of assumed you would play that accidental and not some note that sounded alien to the key. Mm -hmm. that, that, I think that brings me to one of the points that I find really important in a good performance of Bach. And that's that someone has sensitivity to the harmonies and the key they're in. Um, not just for their intonation, but also just as to where the direction of the music is going. And I think there are a lot of people who uh, haven't played enough Bach and don't develop that sensitivity. And they tend to just uh, run straight through it like a, uh, a freight train, uh, playing everything kind of equal. But there's a lot of nuance, I think, with pedagogic accent and bringing out musical lines and things that's very important in Bach. Mr. Greenhouse was always talking about that sort of thing and telling us, you know, have character in your music. You don't just play it, give it some character and some expression. I totally agree. And I think another thing to mention is that to understand the dance form, I, I was really enlightened by experiencing a Baroque dance class that was taught by a, a master who, uh, teaches Baroque dance for film and all sorts of things. Um, and it was so interesting to, to learn about the, the Gavat, for instance, or the Almond, what the actual steps are and where, where the emphasis are, um, where the beats are. And it really made a huge difference to me. And another person we, we featured in one of these online presentations was Loretta O'Sullivan, who plays with uh, the Bethlehem Bach group. And she's a very experienced Baroque player. And, um, We've talked a lot about the, the actual steps, where the emphasis are, not just in your sort of 21st century or 20th century informed idea of, of what it is, but to see, act, to, to see someone actually dance those steps 
not that these pieces would be danced to, but Bach certainly was aware of rhythmic patterns of the steps yeah. because they were the most popular thing at court, right? Whether if you were in France or you were in Germany or you were, you know, wherever you happened to be, the dance was uh, indicative of your education, your culture, your et cetera. Yeah, quite true. Um, here's another question. The one from Jeff Solo. Looking at Stinson's book, which I have, I don't see anything stating that Kellner's six suite dates from the 1727. Here's another question I'm trying to decipher. So the fourth measure of the Saraband from the second suite, B natural versus B flat. Saraband. Okay. Fourth measure. This is like Battleship. I love it. B natural or B flat? I think it's clearly a B natural. All the sources have a B natural. Okay. <laughs> Another question, on the first note of number five, Gavat one, should it be a B flat or a natural? Measure 31. Okay, last measure here. That's a B flat. There's an interesting example of a controversial note in the prelude of the fifth suite. This is in the fugue, and we're, we're this off. And many people are used to playing a, uh, a G natural there. Um, C and D actually have a G, and source A is rather difficult to read. It's like you can see it's very blurred and kind of written between the two lines right here. Um, I'll make it bigger. So th this right here is suspicious. Is that a G or an A? I think it's both. Um, but <laughs> looking down here, we have A natural, but then in the lute suite, it's the equivalent of an A natural. So um, we are, uh, I think, able to trust that what Bach put in the lute suite uh, confirms that B and E have the right note. And I, I've been playing this one for years, so I've kind of gotten used to it. But at first, it was very jarring. I was used to that G. And again, this is an error of perseveration. If you were just to copy the G from measure 189 and 191, and then two measures later, just put the same thing. So we're going to G here. <laughs> We're going to A on that beat. I'm looking up a source for Baroque dance publications. This is a fascinating <laughs> uh, website, but it's also um, sources a whole bunch of other things. Earlydancecircle.co.uk. Let's see if I can put this in the chat. Oh, here someone says, uh, Meredith Little's book, Dance and the Music of J.S. Bach, is great. Yeah, that's good. I, I feel like one aspect of Boeing's is that you want the Boeing to be dancing. And um, so in general, I think Bach changed bows on the bar line and on the beat. That's sort of the general 90% uh, of the time choice that he made. And I think it's for that reason to bring out the meter of the music and uh, the dance aspect comes out that way. So I know that um, many people ch change Boeing's, do Boeing's that go across the beat uh, to make it seem smoother, but I, or, or maybe to bring out the changing note in, in the phrase. But I think it's much better to stick with the Boeing showing the beat and then have other nuances that bring out the changing line and that sort of thing. You want to talk a little bit about vibrato or ornamentation? Well, I'm pretty fond of starting on the upper note of trills. And I think for many, many years, that was the accepted thing. There was a book by Donington, which uh, was 
kind of the authority when I was in school at Eastman. There's another book that came out, uh, which threw a lot of doubt into the whole thing. There are people who think you shouldn't start on the top note if it's coming from a note above or things like that. What I see in these appoggiaturas that the sources C, D, and E put is that often they're putting an upper note start appoggiatura before a trill, which makes me think they're just reiterating that that's how it should be played. Um, so you see that, especially I, I'm recalling in suite five. So we'll go to the Alman and here this one we have. Um, <laughs> And they've got the, the grace note written in there. Um, and that was in C, D, E, and H. Then in the following measure, the same thing. Not sure I would play any of those actually. I would start the, the trills from the top note. I think these got added later in the century just because that was more the style. I have a question. This is a question that I've always thought about and wondered about. Um, in the, the the prelude of the D minor, these last chords, um, you hear all sorts of different interpretations of those chords. Some people arpeggiate them. Some people improvise within each one. Um, some people play them sustained, like a like like you might try to emulate the organ sound. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have any discussion about sustained chords because it's the one of the few places that it shows up right so was that well there is some of that um like in the saravan of the sixth suite very at least lots of double stops not just a really a series series of chords but um but this is kind of a unique spot in the suites and i think that's why people have battled with it you know Maybe this isn't how it's supposed to be played. My feeling is that there aren't any examples where Bach wrote an abbreviation of something and left it up to the player. Um, that happened a lot in Italy, but not with Bach's music. So uh, I'm glad to hear you say that. Jeffrey Solo says, nobody knows how those chords were intended to be played. Only source D shows them as being 16th notes, but that source probably dates from the 1790s. I mean, I'm, I tend to agree with you, David, that, that if Bach had wanted something other than sustained chords, he would have written it. Um, so that's my, opi that's my opinion. But. Okay. Well, I've been puzzled what those two strokes on the stems meant. Maybe Jeffrey's right that that's uh, 16th. Uh, it's just, uh, like I said, there, there's no other case where Bach wrote a shorthand for such a thing. And then uh, none of the sources except that particular source show anything like that. Maybe source D was attempting to uh, figure out how to play these chords also. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Well, anybody have any other questions? Here's one. Uh, the violin solo works have several instances, according to Jeffrey. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. Pause for debate. Yeah. Similar things with chords? Yes, that's, you know, like in the Chacon, there's a long section. Uh, and in Fugues, he has that. He usually puts in an abbreviation for arpeggio saying ARP, period, or colon, uh, but not always. Uh, but when they, those are all in the middle of the piece. No, there is no other place that in any of the string ones where you get chords like that at the end of, of a movement. And uh, that's why I say from all the research I've and reading I've done on it, you know, some people assume that, oh, there's no question that they're supposed to be turned into some sort of 16s. Uh, but there is a question because nobody knows. Uh, I think it's possible you could play chords and add all kinds of ornaments to them. I've done them. I've done them actually in all of the different ways. And you can find musicologists who argue in both directions for chords and for turning them into 16ths. But I, I maintain nobody knows. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in those cases in the Chacon, doesn't Bach write out the first part of the figuration and then he puts Yes, that he he shows you one two beats of arpeggiation, but in fugues he doesn't always do that. Well, in the in the example of the Sarabande of the six suite, you know, you have these chords that are that are physically impossible to sustain. You have to make choices about which notes you <laughs> are melodic notes, right? Which ones you let go of just out of physicality of playing them. Um, yeah, but that's just because Bach, it would have been an incredible uh, travail to write out rests underneath parts of the chord, which of course he did once in a, you know, every so often, like in the prelude of the fifth suite where he'll write a, a rest for one voice, but his, his standard way of writing is just you write the chord. And if you look at the Chacon, you know, where you've got the yam, bati yam, yam, uh, he has a whole note and then a 16th, I mean, then the pickup, the eighth note, which actually makes the measure too long because he would have had to have uh, put a very complicated double or triple dotted note to work it in. And I think it was just, ah, everybody's going to know what it means. So they just, you know, wrote, if you had to copy all this stuff out by hand, you'd want to take shortcuts too. Oh yeah. <laughs> all right. And I think the performer is not really expected to hold the lower note all the time. I just pulled up this example from the second suite, the Saraband of the second suite. Okay. So you can let go of the lower note. I think it's much more likely in the style that it shouldn't sure. be sustained. Well, that would have been influenced by the bow that they used also. Perhaps. Because if you if you um if you think about it, I mean I'm, I'm, some people have experimented with uh, baroque bows or transitional bows. The 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 weight is in the middle of the bow, not in the lower third, the balance of the bow. So the 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 accent or the um, inflection is qu quite quite a different feeling in the in the arm. If you want to get technical about it, um, so when you sustain something, it actually the sound doesn't doesn't really sustain all that well. It's more of a, a gesture. I don't have a cello to demonstrate right now, but um, wow. I think it's interesting when you hear Baroque specialists how they take a, a different approach to the uh, use of the weight and speed of the bow. And it's something, you know, our, our dear professor, uh, Mr. Greenhouse, spent a lot of time talking about with, with his students, um, at least with me, uh, bow speed, um, point of contact, mm -hmm. proximity to the bridge. Um, and even though he played on a quote unquote modern instrument with a modern bow, um, the sort of aesthetic or the style of playing, I think, was was a, a very classical style and um, or, you know, a, a lighter, a lighter approach, shall we say. What you were saying about the bow use made me think of this spot in the prelude of the second suite. It goes on. It, it's not like the, the bowing that's being used up to that point in that movement. Mm -hmm. And you actually see a couple of these dots on the notes in source B, but the other sources don't have that. And then you have to look carefully at the slurs and say, oh, is, is it really just over three notes? And it appears to be, although in source D, it's two and two until the second measure, then it's in one plus three. <laughs> Well, this is this is I feel like this is a discussion that could go on for a very long time. <laughs> I I highly recommend um if you use iPad that you get a copy or you down you 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 get David's edition. It's um tremendously useful and thought provoking and uh refreshing to to kind of learn these pieces again in a in a more informed way and then make your own decisions. Quite come true. up, come up with your own fingerings and bowings based on your own instincts, your own intuition. Mm -hmm. um, that's what makes them so great.
<laughs> I, I think there was actually speaking of Boeing's, there was a, a tendency during the 18th century for the copyists later in the century to put more slurs. In fact, in the first edition, some of the slurs get kind of carried away with unusual inventions. <laughs> in the fifth suite, prelude. Yeah, this, this um, Boeing is on every other measure in sources C and D. So um, it's this. Uh, but you can see C and D put a slur every other bar, whereas A and B have no slurs at all. And it just strikes me that that was probably added by one of those intermediate copyists. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great. <laughs> well, does anyone have anything to say? Let's see here. Um, <laughs> uh, well, everybody's probably been looking at the chat while I was looking up to have my score here. Uh, but Jeffrey says, there's a strong evidence that the cellist and box circle held their bows underhand to gamba style. I tend to think that that's true. Um, Patrick Grant said, said, hi, Patrick, this is wonderful. This conversation has gone on for 400 years. Why stop now? Thank you, David. Thank you, Kate. This is great. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? Uh, <laughs> Rudy, I can't quite understand what that means but many thanks many thanks to you and uh, bongshan says thanks david for such a precious work and session um terrific everybody i really appreciate your support and your love and devotion to the cello and to the music of bach without bach what would life be you know it's um we're tremendously fortunate to have such a rich resource and uh, and David's interest to keep it uh, fresh for the 21st century. And those of us who like to use the iPad, <laughs> I love the navigation. I think it's just fantastic. It really, it, it marries the, my love of music and technology. <laughs> uh, one last couple last questions. Can we email if other questions come up? Yes, of course you can email. Um, and uh, I, I recommend that people, uh, reach out through the website, join the VCS, give us your feedback, uh, you know, share your, your thoughts and your um, suggestions. This, this is your society. This is your group of people to um, enjoy this music and our instrument and the people who play it. And uh, I look forward to more stuff in the future. And I think we'll, we'll continue the online presentations and in the future because uh, it brings a lot more people together. Well, thanks, uh, David and Kate. Yay, thanks everybody. Thanks to the board. Thanks to Lyra. Lyra, you are, uh, without you, this, this will be Hello. very challenging <laughs> indeed. So um, happy summer and uh, enjoy your cello playing. Everybody practice. <laughs> Thank you so much.